And now we get to our last session. And to lead us in this last session is AGS Counselor and Director of Global, Global Markets for Credit Suisse, Adrienne Dicker Kaczynski. Adrienne? Uh, good afternoon. So uh, I'm always pleasantly surprised when people who really should know better give me a hot mic. Um, I just introduce myself real quickly, because uh, my bio is actually already outdated. I'm a high-speed bag lady. I just left my last job yesterday, taking today off, start my new job Monday. Uh, but I'm with Credit Suisse, and uh, my new role, I'll be the head of global innovation for the group chief information officer. So it's a nice fit with this uh, audience here. Um, I'm, I know you're probably not as excited about the last session as I am, because when people see the words investment, ownership and access, I think a lot of people's eyes glaze over. Um, but I actually do think this has the potential to be one of the most interesting sessions of the forum, just because I think it might be a little bit unusual in terms of how you're processing uh, this concept of future of mobility. So um, we have uh, some interesting speakers today. We're going to start with Jeff Holt, who's Managing Director of Bank of Montreal, who has for decades financed some of the largest infrastructure projects around the globe. He's going to take us through North American infrastructure development and financing trends. Uh, and he's really talking about the transport of goods and services to billions of people in very densely populated urban centers around the world. Um, so then we're going to telescope down doc to Dr. Mona Atia, whose research is intensely local. Uh, she is working with sparse, dispersed populations in the Southern Hemisphere, and she'll share today uh, with us the difficulties that small, isolated villages in North Africa need, uh, how, what they need to overcome their lack of connection with the rest of the world. Um, and then finally, Norm Anderson, uh, he's going to take us on a little bit of a wild card journey uh, through the technology innovations that are continuing to evolve and that may actually help bridge the world of Jeff with the world of Mona. So please, uh, I'd like you to welcome our final panelists and speakers of the day. Uh, and if you could join us on the stage, please, or join us, me, sorry. <laughs> Uh, geography is the most important aspect of the, uh, of the goods movement and transportation business. I've been in the business 37 years, and uh, as Dean Wise knows, who invited me to speak, uh, the geography of goods movement is, is the most exciting part because it's, there's discoveries made almost every, uh, every few weeks, uh, I would say, somewhere on the planet. The, the elements of, of goods movement transportation are linked to geography in almost every single way. The size of ships um, are getting larger and larger, and it's because of scale. Everything to do with transportation results favorably when you move it to scale. So we are talking about the very largest right now. We'll be talking about the very smallest uh, mobility and access soon. But the price of goods and the price of services is driven by scale. Scale is highly, highly dependent on good geography. The best ships, the biggest ships, the best direct routes, uh, the, the lowest costs, et cetera, are all linked to uh, the goods, goods movement and transportation. Rail networks, uh, depth of harbors, bridge deck heights, Physical parameters have uh, real impacts on, on cost per goods of goods sold and uh, per lift charges on containers and valuations of all of these assets. Uh, since 2005, it's put a fine point on this that most of the, of the goods movement in North America has been shifting uh, to the financial sectors of, uh, away from the developers, and I'll be showing some of that in a second. Um, you can see that some of the big ship orders that we, we you know, 10 years ago we thought an 8,000 TEU ship was a big ship. A TEU is a 20-foot equivalent unit. Now we're getting uh, order books of 22,000 TEUs. None of these will fit under the Verrazano Narrows Bridge. They just raised the Bayonne Bridge to 210 feet, and that's basically the bridge deck height at, uh, at the Verrazano Narrows. So the entire New York Harbor, for over 25 million consumers uh, in, in, the, in this 300-mile uh, radius of New York, uh, will be served by something less than 18,000 TEU ships, 
and for those, they'll have to take the, uh, the antennas down before they go under those bridges. So that's the kind of bridge deck heights we're talking about. The narrowness of the Kilvan Cull is an issue. There'll be extra pilots to move those ships through and extra tugs to get them through. And it's all about scale. It's all about putting as many boxes on one ship as possible. And then, how fast can you unload the ship and how fast can you load it up and send it back on its way? This is all about scale, and it's, and it's very, very much about geography. Uh, the, so the forward order books are, are very meaningful in terms of what the, the, the world's carriers are doing and ordering bigger and bigger ships to deliver goods on a, on a per box basis at a much cheaper price. You can see that the Great Circle has had a huge impact in the last few years. Uh, in the 1880s, uh, the Grand Trunk Railroad was developed into Prince Rupert, British Columbia, which is 700 miles north of Vancouver. And it's been underutilized until just the last few years. And all of a sudden, CN Railroad, uh, together with the Marr Brothers over in New Jersey, decided to basically put money into Prince Rupert Terminal and develop a gateway there. It's since changed hands, and now Dubai Ports World owns it, and it's the most successful terminal in North America because of this one thing, and that's the Great Circle. Uh, the, the, it's four days faster by rail, or excuse me, four days faster by ship, two days faster by rail, and it's about $400 per box cheaper because the, because the Grand Trunk Railroad goes through lower mountains as it goes through the West Coast, as opposed to the Sierras and the Cascades and the Rocky Mountains. And so it delivers goods a lot faster. So you're seeing a giant shift of commodities up the coast. Regardless of path dependency of decades and decades, the containers are making their way up to Vancouver and to, and to Prince, little Prince Rupert with absolutely zero population uh, base. It's, getting, it's, it's, it's making this giant shift based strictly on geography. The Panama Canal just recently completed its third set of locks, a massive cost, but it transfers now it, it, it basically puts an economic value on the 28-day savings of going all the way around uh, the Cape uh, and, and essentially taxes the world's economy, the world's economic goods, to some extent transferring those payments to the government of Panama now that the U.S. has transferred the, the asset to the Panamanian government. Results in about a billion dollars a year in terms of, of uh, transfer payments to the, to the government of Panama, which is its, of course, single largest source of revenue. There are other ideas for Nicaragua and the Straits of Tehuantepec in Mexico. The Straits of Tehuantepec doesn't have the tidal differential that Panama has, and so you wouldn't have to put locks in. It wouldn't be the big bathtub of fresh water. And so essentially, if you ran an open Suez-type canal through the Straits of Tehuantepec, you'd cut off two days' sail from Panama, and basically you could run ships through without queuing up. It's a, it's, it would be a fantastic, uh, and will happen someday. It would uh, revitalize the economy of southern Mexico were it to be done. Infrastructure and infrastructure investments has always been dependent on cutting off the fastest way or figuring out uh, a, a cheaper way of doing things, a quicker route. This is the, this, a picture of the Cumberland Gap. It was really the original big investment for, for cutting off geography and making it work. Infrastructure is, is a, a definition now. It's a whole class of investment, and it requires semi-monopolistic um, uses. It requires um, uh, large, broad use by a tax-paying base or a, or a user base, a broad user base, uh, some sort of barriers to entry, um, and uh, long-lived assets. And all of a sudden, if you get that kind of a classification, you've woken up a new class of investors, which are uh, the infrastructure funds, and primarily Australian and uh, European and Canadian, with some participation in the U.S. pension funds, the U.S. public pension funds, but mostly driven out of Canada, Australia, and Europe. What, what that means is, is that the entire infrastructure space was revalued in 0506 because of the dot-com bubble bursting and everyone's returns being uh, lowered dramatically. The infrastructure funds were created by the pension funds to segregate a certain portion of their capital, about 15% each, and target towards these semi-monopolistic uh, investments. What it does is it, dro it drove the returns down from maybe the 20% return target range to some, something like an 11 to 12% in my space. 
uh, in, the, in the shipping space. And that dramatically improved values and dramatically improved access to capital. But still, it's all about scale. These are folks that are interested in very, very large cash flowing assets. The next slide here is, is uh, essentially the ownership of all of the terminals uh, in the largest terminals in North America uh, by the infrastructure funds in 2005. And then how much of each of those gateways is now owned by the infrastructure funds today. You can see it's a massive, massive shift. So it basically allows, allows funds to drill down on various types of risk and they are liberating massive amounts of capital into the space. Uh, the investor landscape has is, is grown absolutely dramatically. Pension funds, uh, infrastructure funds, and sovereign wealth funds. It opens up new ideas. Uh, one new idea that I'd like to present today is, 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 is for the Hyperloop and right-of-way uh, in, in the West. It's very difficult to get rights-of-way out West. One of the, uh, one of the uh, developments that happened as states became states, they were given certain tracts of land to their schools. Uh, they, but they were given these tracts of lands in patterns that were not very helpful or not very useful. They're more like quilts. You can see in the, in, the, in the charts here, the public lands that were given for schools uh, put a pattern together that is very unusable. They're not stripes, they're not rights of way, they're not even gathered around city centers in, for the most part. But there's massive amounts of land that the schools are saying, what do we do with this? I don't know. So they're centering them around mines and uh, you know, gold mines and coal fields and gas and, and oil and things like that. And they really have not taken uh, best advantage of it. What, what we've been asking them to consider is maybe putting together stripes and rights of way and prepping for the hyperloop uh, and things like things uh, cooperating together. And the infrastructure funds are the ones that are going to be interested in developing those networks of links between all of the cities and gridding uh, the cities with faster uh, connections between all the different spots. Um, the outlook for infrastructure investment is there's massive amounts of capital. It, as I say, it's driven the returns down to a, such a low level, it's absolutely mind-boggling. You can, you can fund something at, you know, a brand new project at the 10 to 12 percent uh, capital range. Uh, but the, the minimum check size is about $500 million in equity. They just won't play for any less. It takes just as much to put a, a several billion dollar portfolio together than it, it, as it does to put a $10 million portfolio together. So for these folks to get access to this kind of capital and that attractive capital, it really has to be of size. Um, that's my presentation today. Thank you so much. Um, Mona, would you uh, like to take the mic next? So I'm going to be making the case today for thinking about mobility in a very different geography and for those who are the least mobile. That is the poorest of the poor. This research that I'm sharing with you today was funded by the National Science Foundation and supported by work with two GW graduate students. This is the Noor Solar Complex in the Moroccan Southwest. It is a mega project that is capable of producing 160 megawatts of power and co covers thousands of acres of desert. Phase one was launched last year and upon completion of phase two and phase three, it will be the single largest solar power production facility in the world. Even with just one phase completed, you can see the solar plant from space. The plant is outside of a town called Werzazet. It is in the left-hand corner of this map, and the lower right-hand corner shows the reservoir that is supplying the plant with water. While development investments are growing in mega projects such as these, there is a worldwide infrastructure gap. Global in scale, despite the prevalence of investment funds, it is not enough to support the demand, particularly in the global south, where there is rapid urbanization and a growing middle class. The infrastructure gap in the global south is actually larger than that in the global north, despite currency valuations. The African Development Bank is the biggest funder of infrastructure projects in Africa. This is part of their Map Africa initiative, which is an initiative to map investments in sustainability. 
Even on this map, I've circled in red the region of Dera Tafilet, which is covered by my case study. And you can see there's a very different kind of infrastructure gap here. The goal of my presentation today is to demonstrate to you that even in 2017, there are still pockets of poverty and places that will be left behind in our grand visions of technology and, advance, ad, and advancement towards 2050. For these places, mobility depends upon access to roads, basic infrastructure, access to water, electricity, schools, hospitals, marketplaces to sell their agricultural products, and access to the internet. But these are remote places, places that house marginalized communities. So even while this community is less than 100 kilometers away from the largest solar complex in Africa and soon to be in the world, the communities housed there do not benefit from this immense growth and investment. The concentrated solar power project in Wersesat involves the acquisition of over 3,000 hectares of community-owned land to produce energy largely for Europe. The tribes that had communal lands in this region were actually forced to sell that land to the state at about 10 cents per square meter, or one-tenth of their actual use value. Yes, NOR is an infrastructure project but it requires the transfer of ownership, use rights, and control over resources from the poor to the state and investors. So I'd like to draw your attention today to the different scales of uneven development. The map to the left is the Moroccan poverty map, and it is based on the 2014 census. The pink regions are the poorest regions. I've zoomed in on my region of case study, Dera Tafilet, because it is the poorest region according to the Moroccan census. Within that region, the province of Tinrir is the site of my case studies. Even within this poor province, there are pockets of wealth and pockets of poverty. So through focus groups and interviews in the region, I have found that one of the biggest determinants of poverty for villagers are access to roads, whether for people or for goods. This is a typical footbridge that a villager must use to cross the Magoon River to get to the closest paved road, which then leads them to the closest schools and hospitals. Villagers frequently walk five miles each way to and from by foot just to reach this footpath. Women, sorry, footbridge. Women on their journey to collect firewood and children on their way to school have to walk across these bridges every single day. The problem arises when it rains and the riverbeds flood and the communities on this side of the river are completely cut off, sometimes for days or even for months. There are a variety of problems that villagers face with the existing infrastructure. The bridges are makeshift and ill-equipped. So much so that my own research team was stranded and could not return to our field site in the summer of 2016. And this was the summer just after one hour of rainstorms on the national road, the best road available. And it is the main through, through fare through which the entire region is connected, an extension of that very same road that the trucks that supply uh, um, supplies to the solar plant use to deliver their goods. So a lack of infrastructure means a lack of development, whether it be rain, snow, having to walk 10 miles in mountainous terrain, or uh, desert sun to arrive at a paved road by foot, or carrying one's goods to the marketplace on a motorcycle on a narrow bridge, villagers experience a lack of mobility every single day of their lives. And they regularly shared these stories with me about how roads and mobility were key to their development. Furthermore, the marginalization of places is even further exacerbated by the fact that Google thinks they do not exist. This is one of our case study villages. Google is in the bottom, sorry, uh, Google Images is the bottom right hand corner. OpenStreetMap is the top left hand corner after we had done a GW Mapathon. Working with GW Humanitarian Mapping Society, we were able to map over 7,000 edits in one evening, literally putting this village on the map. But because of the importance of roads to people's mobility and development work, we decided to work with the villagers to create a map of road obstacles using field papers, because there's inadequate internet, 
and we asked them to mark all of the obstacles that they face in their daily lives and how it impacted them. Flooding was the primary obstacle due to insufficient infrastructure, and it often prevented children from going to school, farmers from getting their crops to the market in time, and women from getting vital health care during pregnancy. The maps we created in two communes were then circulated at the Festival of the Roses, the major attraction for the region, which is also well known for the rose essence that it produces. The communities actually began to use these maps to make important claims to the government for better infrastructure. While there are numerous development actors in the region, none are actually interested in building roads. They see this as part of the job of the state, and they lack an understanding of the spatiality of poverty. You see, development agencies target the poor using poverty maps. And the prevailing strategy amongst these development agencies and aid organizations is to take advantage of something called a marketplace town, like Kalat Maguna. These large towns, larger towns are typically on a major road or the national road, have higher populations with villages surrounding them, and are the only site for a healthcare facility, local government offices, a high school or youth center, and of course a marketplace. Aid agencies concentrate their projects in these yellow dots, using economies of agglomeration. All development training sessions, machinery, resources, professional networks, et cetera, happen in these market towns under the assumption that they are actually reaching everyone in the region. But our research shows that these marketplace towns are often far from central for villagers, and there is very uneven access to them. Research participants from these remote areas emphasize the, need, the complete absence of any development projects in their enclaves, and the daily difficulties of the dangerous, unmaintained, time-consuming footpaths that they must traverse to reach the services that are meant for them. So what? Well, despite the use of these poverty maps, interventions continue to be concentrated in the same accessible spaces, reinforcing the marginalization of Romo areas. Here I've used kernel density maps, using government data to map national development projects on the right-hand side, and we show that they're highly concentrated across the paved roads and near to urban centers. On the left-hand side, the villages are widely dispersed. International aid continues to invest in these market towns, which reinforces existing inequalities even in this remote geography. Remote villages are remote because we continue to think of them that way, and we treat them that way, and they will continue to be remote because they don't matter enough for investors, states, and also because of a lack of data. In my fieldwork with development actors, they were well aware of some of these obstacles, but they frequently said that they could not factor mobility into their development decisions because there simply was no data. My graduate students and I decided to create data for our case studies using roads and river data from OpenStreetMap, the most complete data sets available. We also used village data and health center and school data from the government and elevation data. We created what we call a composite uh, accessibility index. While I don't have time to go into how exactly we calculated this, here are the results. The villages in the red are the most remote. They are the furthest away from paved roads and have to cross a riverbed or a mountain range in order to reach the market town. These villages remain peripheral and without access to roads, schools, health centers, and basic services. Sure. Development aid can't actually reach every single town and every single villager, but they certainly can do a better job in considering mobility into their actual considerations of where aid should go. So the Rural Accessibility Index allows us to identify clusters of relatively high population remote village enclaves that can serve as new service centers or service points for municipalities and provinces, offering an opportunity to allow for more equitable distribution of aid to remote places. They also represent an untapped investment opportunity. But I close with images of protests from just two weeks ago. These villagers are, marking, are marching to the municipal government demanding roads, electricity, water, and better internet access. They are from one of those remote villages on the previous slide. For these villagers, their mobility was their greatest demand. The police stopped them 
on the road and sent them home with threats of imprisonment. We are not the only ones who are talking about mobility. Mobility matters a great deal to even the most marginalized communities in faraway places. But there is a risk to all of us if these communities are not included in our vision of 2050. Flying cars are fantastic, but for these communities, mobility starts with basic infrastructure. Yet there are deeply entrenched barriers to progress, legal, regulatory, social, political, the terrain itself, financial, etc. But they must be overcome. If we are even to think about these spaces as important, they will, if we do not continue to think of them as important, they will continue to be marginalized even in 2050. Therefore, I close and continue to remind you to remember just two things. Investment is uneven at all scales, global, the country scale, the region scale, and even amongst communities. But basic infrastructure for all, even the remotest places with sparse populations, is actually essential for global development and security. Thank you very much. So this is the, the wonders of Steve Jobs in Macintosh. What, what I want to talk about really quickly, and I'll try to be quick, how much time do I have? Maybe 10 minutes, maybe less? Take, take what you need. Okay. So I want to talk about a little bit about how you think about um, mobility and thinking about the user experience. I was visiting uh, Bruce at Hyperloop, I think just two days ago. It's fantastic, right, the way people are starting to think about mobility. Um, but one of the things that people don't think about very much when you're thinking about infrastructure, and I think it really does combine the two things that you guys are talking about, is, is what do users need and how do users think about that and how do you bend technology to users' needs rather than do whatever technology lets you do, right? So that's one of the things I want to talk about, the user experience, how everything is speeded up so enormously that it's really hard to figure out how to think about things, and then how to figure out how to engage, how to use technology to engage people in these decisions that determine our future. And one of the things we're spending a lot of time doing is looking at blockchain and how that allows everybody to participate in decisions from the very beginning and actually developing our own cryptocurrency to do that so that you can architect the future rather than become a victim of technological uh, determinism. Sorry, I'm doing this all on my iPhone, so I'm very confused. Um, the infrastructure investment piece is really interesting. And I'm gonna, this, this is a, 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 a poll that we did, a survey that we did in Brazil in August 2017 with Ipsos of 1,500 Brazilians. And the question we asked was, what does investment in infrastructure mean to you? And 37% said health. 36% said mobility. Then education, then quality of life, then clean water, then employment. Only 4% said highways. 5% said highways, it was four. And 2% uh, said rail, ports, and airports. Isn't that interesting? Because we all think about infrastructure as things, but people think about infrastructure as experience. Um, that's one of the things that I think is, is fascinating. So it's really thinking about the user experience is unbelievably important. You know, there's that famous uh, video of Steve Jobs when he came back to Apple, and somebody in the audience asked him a question about a specific technology, and he had to drink about eight bottles of water or eight gulps of water before he could answer because he's such a nice guy, he was a little ticked off. And, but, it, but it's this, his point was, you gotta think about the user experience. Nobody does that in infrastructure, and if you do that, then you start to really think about the kinds of people that you're talking about in villages around the world, and what do they need, and, and, what, and how do you provide health to them? And then it's the bigger question, of how do you get, give them a voice so they can provide, ask for services and design services for themselves. And one of the big problems, I think, is I was talking to the CEO of AES earlier this week, and he said that things are happening so fast 
that stuff that he thought, and he's a technologist, would take five years is taking one year. So I, I just put together some graphs um, very quickly to give you guys a sense of this. On the drone side of things, um, it used to take four months, something that used to take four months to survey, now it takes two weeks with a drone and the information's perfect. So, so all sorts of things could happen. Permitting and approval process still takes nine years on a highway project in the US. On the innovation side, um, Bruce, I probably have this wrong, but I think the, the, um, the example that Hyperloop uses was they were trying to get uh, 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 an er engineering company to produce an electric motor for them. They cut the time down dramatically, and the original cost was $800 million, and they cut it down to about $20 million. Um, new ways of thinking about infrastructure are transforming what we do. And then the, the idea of cryptocurrency, you know, someone was, was uh, debating with me, I guess, the other day, because we are putting together something called BuildCoin and already using it to um, fund 51 feasibility studies of municipal lighting projects in Brazil. And the person said, but cryptocurrencies, that's nonsense. It's not going to go anywhere. It doesn't make any sense. And the point I made to him was, but the global infrastructure market is 555 times larger than the Paraguayan economy. And people think the Par Paraguay's currency, the Guarani, is fantastic, is stable, et cetera. And he said, well, that's because Paraguay can tax. Well, so what? Um, doesn't matter. The, the global infrastructure community is actually interesting in terms of its ability. Now we can think about the global infrastructure community as an actual thing. And it's probably, you know, four, five, six trillion dollars. So what I'm really trying to, to get at here is I'm trying to get at this point that we're at a Tr tremendous transition point in our existence on Earth. One of the points that you guys make all the time, and if you think about how we need to think about the future, if you think about infrastructure, if you think about you know, owners, if you think about who should be owners and who should be making decisions, I think it's you guys who should be making decisions uh, and I think everybody needs to have a, a role in this process. So if you look at the value chain in terms of making decisions on infrastructure, you start with a feasibility study, you go through the approvals process, you fund it, you construct it, and then you have the operations and maintenance piece, which is some seven times the initial capital cost of a project. So you're basically making decisions right now for something that needs to last for 30 or 40 years. But right now, you guys aren't making those decisions. I'm not making those decisions. Uh, somebody sitting in, in, in a computer someplace looking at a CAD system is making those decisions. What we think is with, with blockchain, you can actually start to create the kind of transparency and the kind of access and the kind of credibility for infrastructure to get everybody involved in making fundamental infrastructure decisions. People at the village level, people all over the world, uh, you guys at every single stage in the process. And we also think that a new kind of currency makes a huge amount of sense for the infrastructure space. This is where the bankers really love me. Um, because if you think about it, what gets you guys up in the morning, right? You guys didn't decide that the only reason I'm going to get up in the morning is if I can make a ton of money, right? You guys love what you do. People involved in infrastructure all over the world love what they do. They love to be able to share their ideas. Engineers, why, why would they give, is, is the only reason that they're going to share an idea about a, a road uh, in Morocco because somebody paid them? No, they have all this knowledge. And what's really interesting is you can create a whole ecosystem that gives them access, recognition, um, uh, the kind of, uh, peer uh, um, recognition, community access, et cetera, and pays them as, as well. So there's an opportunity, I think, that we have to create a whole new uh, ecosystem around our infrastructure. And I just wanted to put this slide together very quickly, because it also goes to the point about what's important 
in our world. If you look at the largest U.S. engineering construction company, its market cap is $5.4 billion. Bombardier is $6.9 billion. Ford Motor Company, Tesla. But if you look at Bitcoin, it was at $132 billion today. So trying to figure out how to think about where the global economy is going and how you would provide access to people like you in terms of major decisions and also in terms of being investors in major projects. No reason why um, you can't set aside a large project to have 10% of people who live in the community uh, invest in those projects and get the same kinds of dev dividends that pension fund uh, holders get around the world. Um, whole series of issues that you need to think about if you're thinking about infrastructure, but the biggest one, every time we do a survey of anybody, anywhere, people go, where's the vision? Where, what kind of a world do we want to live in? How do you make sense of any of these investments without having a vision? And, and I guess our point is that everybody walks around with a computer in their hand now, and so why can't they have a voice on all of these decisions all through the process? There's actually no reason why they, they can't. And one of the things you have to f figure out is what kind of benefits do you want? What kind of a world do you want to create for your children and your grandchildren? Um, and that's how you need to think about the, pro the issues in Morocco, the issues around trade, around mobility in our cities. Uh, by 2020, customer experience will overtake price and product as the key brand differentiator. But what, what, what I'm really thinking about is what do we want the future to look like? Because you know, doing whatever technology allows us to do is really dumb, but I don't see people actually thinking about, I mean, you guys maybe, but the guys with the money aren't exactly thinking about what our vision needs to be. And I think a vision comes more from inside us than anything else in terms of how we want to live and what kind of a world we want to live in, especially since we all can see each other now. You know, we all can see the people in Morocco who don't have opportunities, and we know how to provide them with opportunities. So how do we make that happen? And the last thing I wanted to do, because this is my favorite thing, is the flame. <laughs> but look at the kind of infrastructure we used to build, right? It's magnificent infrastructure. It told you what the public sector, th it's a public sector thing. It's not a private sector thing. It tells you what the government thinks about citizens, that you can be great, that you can be fantastic, that you can be aesthetically incredible. And it, and it tells, it, it really gives you a sense of, of what we can do as, as, a, as a collective unit. We don't do that anymore. You have sort of brutalist architecture, et cetera. So there's a real different way to think about infrastructure. And you know, hopefully it combines what we've been talking about here. And the, the big piece of it is, Everybody can see what everybody, how everybody lives all over the world. So why don't we take advantage of that and figure out how to address these problems? And, and we kind of feel that now is a good time for the world that underinvests by a trillion dollars a year to change the infrastructure paradigm and start to address those issues. So thank you very much. So um, thank you very much to our three speakers. Um, I guess before, real quickly, we open it up to the audience for questions. I do, I'll start with a question uh, that's directed at both Norm and Jeff. Um, so as a banker, uh, I'm always obviously interested in money and the concept of money. And, and we're at an interesting inflection point, I think, where uh, we are looking at what feels to some people like a post-money society. And that has, for the last couple of years, prompted me to start looking at pre-money societies. And I've been doing a lot of research in this area. Um, and so the concepts that Norm is talking about is interesting because there's actually a lot of historical precedent uh, through the millennia, uh, and including in modern money markets as well. And so if we look at uh, what's happening in some of these multilateral exchanges where really it's not so much the currency that's the important thing. The currency is sort of like the shadow on the cave. It's the visual kind of uh, tangible manifestation of the extension of credit. Uh, this idea that I am going to t trust you to deliver a good or a service to me in the future, now or in the future. And so 
Jeff and I come from the world of traditional finance. These are equity infusions by investors. They're financed by debt issuance, uh, you know, and you're relying on the credit and good faith of the, the uh, corporate issuer to pay back the principal and interest that they've owed on time and in full. Um, but what Norm is throwing out there is an interesting uh, return of finance to uh, more, a more localized level. And I, what I think will be the interesting challenge for us is how can you combine the two? And I think there is a way to do it. And you're stealing my thunder a little bit because this is part of what I'm taking a look at when I'm at Credit Suisse is how can you combine a uh, democratized system that is spread out amongst many individuals within a larger institutional finance that's a much more tightly centralized and controlled way of financing things. So I'll, I'll leave that. I don't know if that was completely confusing to everybody listening, but maybe Jeff and Norm know what I'm talking about. Well, maybe I'll. Uh, infrastructure in my world is divided into two different camps. One is revenue producing and one's non-revenue producing. And of course, there's a lot of different kinds of infrastructure uh, uh, health related and other things that investors don't actually necessarily get involved, uh, especially down at the micro level. It basically becomes a governmental function where the governments have to invest. And so they assess risk very differently than the private sector. And so uh, money or, or currency or denominating any of these projects in terms of revenues and actual dollars raised to get them done is really just a measure of risk. It's, it's really about risk. And, uh, and so there's, 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 of course, a massive uh, uh, a continuum of, of risk profiles of various projects. And, 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 and each of those uh, is, is denominated in different rates of return and different uh, front end risk uh, components and equity required, et cetera. Uh, most of the projects uh, in the United States, for example, are zero equity. It's all government bonds, uh, and they're done at a very subsidized interest rate uh, of tax exemption. Uh, that's, that is the backbone of what's gone on in the United States. But worldwide, there are other mixes of capital that make that happen, and private investors are looking for their particular risk profile and their particular size of check. That's really, that's really how that happens. Uh, I, I think in terms of, of getting to other currencies and democratizing that, um, it's, it's, you know, it, it's been democratized in this country because everybody can go out and buy a municipal bond to fund their school. You know, everybody, can, everybody can go buy a $5,000 certificate here or there. But, um, but I think uh, the shift is to larger and less democratized. There's no question about it uh, uh, in my world. But of course, there's a whole bunch of other infrastructure that still needs to be done, and that's going to require a lot of voices to make government move to fund those in other ways. You want me to answer that? I mean, that's a, like a big question. You get a yeah. PhD if you answer that question. Well, to, uh, to, to preview, we're going to do the future of money, uh, not next year or the year after, but I think in year three. So Norm, you're coming. No, that, but that, it's, it's really a, a cool issue because I actually think that, that um, again, you know, you've got a paradigm that no longer works. We underinvest by a trillion dollars a year in infrastructure. We, we can't figure out how to address fundamental issues like the ones that you're talking about. I mean, they're just off the grid completely because they can't pay for their stuff and the government won't pay for it, so they're screwed. Um, and, and I just think that this, this is, there's a reason why we underinvest by a trillion dollars a year globally in infrastructure and, and emerging markets suffer more. And, and what's happening is that, again, everybody has the technology at their fingertips to say, this is what I want and this is how I want to participate in it. And I have a better idea about how to design it than the, somebody who lives in the capital city. Um, and I need to figure out how to participate. And actually, blockchain allows you to do that, right? So you've got right. two big transformations in technology that you can see those just dramatically transforming uh, finance, in, funding, right. investment right. in infrastructure globally at the same time that all your, in, all your infrastructure choices are changing in terms of the physical infrastructure. I mean, all the people talk about we need the money for bridges and roads and all that stuff, but 
that's not what your children and grandchildren are going to be focused on. The way we think about infrastructure, what we really need to invest in is completely different. And if you, and if you ask the crowd what the crowd wants to invest in, they're not going to say, oh, please pick, fix that bridge someplace. They have a bunch of different answers. Okay, and so one question for Mona before then we open up to the group. Um, so Mona, unfortunately, I don't think you got a chance to hear all of the What Three Words presentation, but that certainly seems to uh, provide your villagers with the opportunity to be placed on the map, not just as a satellite image, as in a collection of houses or an open ma uh, street map, but really providing detailed data trackability, traceability, and access. So. Can you talk a little bit about how you think that might open things up? Sure. Um, I think that we can use the what three words um, actually in our mapathons as a way to um, identify these spaces. Because when students come to try and map these rural villages in Morocco, they actually have trouble even finding where they're supposed to start. Um, so that can be immensely useful for the kinds of um, data that we're interested in gathering. As I mentioned before, you know, these places are literally off the map uh, or off the grid, as uh, Norm said. And um, Google, in fact, thinks that they don't exist. So in space, uh, you know, um, in the satellite images, it's clear that they do exist. But get her, getting access to that data and actually just getting um, them some sense of visibility, even within the own we, even within their own countries. Um, the people in Rabat who are making the policies, uh, they don't travel to these spaces. They have no idea really what everyday life is like there. So that's part of the problem. Um, so I guess one of the things is I think that that um, what three words really does have um, a really powerful potential to put places on the map. Are there any questions from the audience? Yes, please. Xiao Shui Xin from Columbia University. Yeah, um, my question is uh, regarding the vision. You ask the people here, what's the vision of the future, of the future technology? And uh, I would ask back the same question as the investor of your vision. Specifically, uh, the reason is, uh, you know, the investment trends affect technology. And uh, money makes people go. Money makes uh, Pokemon go. Money makes uh, ghosts go. And um, so in many cases, so the technology follows money. Um, specifically, um, for example, we have seen so many, so much uh, fancy technology, unmanned um, devices, um, machines, robots. So what you're wishing about in the future um, that's the biggest unseen con consequence. Human being replaced the bay robot. Well, Google AlphaGo beat people, player, and some machine chess player beat human player. Imagine this in the future, maybe by 2050. This room is being filled by half being filled by the robot geographers. And then are we ready for those? Am I supposed to answer that question? <laughs> and, what, and what was that question? This is for Jeff and uh, Roman. Ooh. Your vision as investors. <laughs> uh, you know, I. For, for me, for me, the vision or the future of of um, of mobility and for, of investment is all about what you are all doing in this room. What you are all doing in this room is changing everything very, very rapidly. Uh, one of the biggest auto handlers in the United States is for sale, and uh, and imagine uh, the investor class's questions about auto ownership in the future. Uh, why do we need auto handlers if we might not have autos? And if you ask, uh, or private ownership anyway, and if you ask uh, the investor class if they're willing to take a risk on the basis of that kind of dramatic change in, 
in uh, mobility, but also in geographies. As I said, every five minutes something comes along, somebody's discovered a new pass or a new place or a new depth or a new tunnel or something, and it displaces a whole group of folks, and there are winners and losers. And in the investment space, those winners or losers, a lot of, a lot of that is the vision that goes on in this room. And believe me, every investor's got his thumb on the pulse of what's going on here. Uh, because it absolutely affects the dollars and cents of their returns in the future. But, but you know, the other part of it that, that's, um, I mean, you actually, that's sort of my whole point, right? If there's, if, if we just like the, allow technological determinism to happen, you know, you could imagine a pretty bleak future. So look at, look at a ride sharing service that isn't Uber and that isn't Lyft, but that is uh, fully um, staffed by autonomous vehicles. Is there like one person who gets to own all of that? It doesn't make any sense. It'd be nice if there were a platform and everybody in this room rented your car out to the ride sharing and everybody in this room benefited from that, uh, that uh, investment, uh, that ownership of that capital good. One of the things that we're not doing a good job of thinking about again is, is what kind of a world do we want to live in and the kind of world we want to live in, I think, is one where we have increasing opportunities for people and increasing equality for people as well, certainly equality of opportunity. And we're not really designing our future to think about like that, to optimize that. So that's sort of how I answer that question. Is there another? Uh... Hi, uh, I'm from Russia. And uh, thank you for the uh, Niven development. Uh, uh, with the presentation in Morocco, and uh, it's definitely a global phenomenon, not just uh, in the third world countries, even in the United States, you have uh, small villages have been forgotten and uh, uh, neglected. Uh, in Russia, we had, I'm from Siberia, uh, we have uh, villages that have been uh, forgotten. Uh, in the 1970s, it was a mass development on the agriculture, and the small towns uh, and villages of 200 and less people have been forgotten, and uh, the Russian government government has a, uh, developed a program that uh, those people have been relocated and uh, concentrated in the larger uh, towns and the way they have schools and the infrastructure. Do you think in Morocco in, in, it could be the same uh, solution for the situation? And how can society uh, benefit from if uh, the roads and the electricity will be provided to the small towns? Thank you for your question. Um, so in Morocco, uh, there's rapid urbanization, um, but the government actually uh, doesn't want to encourage people to move, move to cities. 45% um, of the GDP is still from agriculture. And um, in those small remote towns, um, you know, some of the closest cities would be several hours away. So um, people would actually have to be relocated. There are people being relocated, but uh, unfortunately they're actually um, living in urban areas um, because Morocco has um, developed part of its national development strategy is to relocate slum dwellers who are often living either in the center of cities on prime real estate, beachfront real estate uh, that they want to redevelop or um, on the peripheries of cities but in places that are state-owned land, um, again, that, the, that they want to um, uh, take back. So uh, there is massive relocation happening, but it's happening in the cities, um, not in the rural towns. Um, I think that uh, villagers would actually be, um, less and less people want to live as um, subsistence agriculture producers and um, pastoralists. So um, the desire to move to cities is there. And I think that um, if there were investment in medium and small um, size cities, and particularly, for example, you know, we're talking about if there was a tunnel built, the 300 kilometers between Marrakesh and, and this part of Morocco, um, you know, that would instantly change the, the geography of this place. Mar Marrakesh is an immensely um, growing economy, a big tourist destination. Unfortunately, all of the um, rural to urban migration is happening um, to the larger cities still, Casablanca, Tangier, Rabat, um, Marrakesh. So uh, it would have to require investment in not 
those garrison towns like Kalat Maguna, but those smaller cities. Um, and it may, in fact, happen. Uh, Morocco's undergoing a huge policy of regionalization to move uh, resources and, and responsibility for infrastructure to the local level. So there, it, it could potentially happen, but it would require that, that big investment. I've got one, one, one brief comment on yep. that. Um, you know, the United States has a, a, an incredible track record of, of ma uh, meeting the needs of even the smallest community. And the fascination, I think, with our ability to build infrastructure that the world has had is because of the decentralization of all of those investment decisions. It's the small town in this country that decides whether or not it has a uh, a hospital or a road or anything. I mean, they, it's, this, it's the you know, 40,000 special service districts or municipal districts that get together, individual groups, hire their own engineers, hire their own bond council, hire their own bankers and say, what's it going to take for us to put this project together? What's it going to take for us to plug ourselves into the infrastructure space or to add capacity in our region? And that's that decentralization that's made the United States this democracy of, of, uh, of infrastructure. We have, frankly, the most diverse uh, 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 distribution of decision makers and investors uh, and developers. Uh, when, when groups of these assets get gathered up and can be traded back and forth by financial players like infrastructure funds, that's a completely different level. When you, when you have to serve the local community, you're talking about the first out of the box development of that asset. And it's best done by the people that are on the ground. And it's best done when there's rule of law and access to, to, to some sort of funding uh, and an and ability to sort of gather your own strengths and put them put them to work in, in small and in small scaled assets that plug people in. That's, that's the way it's always been done. Can I, uh, so even in the United States though, the part of the problem is that in the communities that are the most remote, for example, West Virginia, you know, huge mining community, the assets are not benefiting the communities that live there. They're just, they have jobs, they create jobs, but they're not able to tap into that wealth in order to create the infrastructure or the schools or the things that they need. So yes, the decentralization in the United States works in our interest, but I think the greater point is that even the most marginalized communities, when they have assets, in Morocco I'm talking about you know, phosphate plants, the solar complex, these large investment spaces, um, the communities are being stripped away of their ownership and, and rights um, to those spaces. So uh, I think that part of that problem is, is again, um, being reinforced by the way in which investments are happening. Yes, go ahead, please. Mark Safran from BA Systems. This conversation kind of reminds me a little of the communications um, infrastructure. Um, and I, I don't know how many years ago, 20, 30 years ago, we might have been having a conference about the future of communications and figuring out where we're going to lay transmission lines. And in the developing countries, they don't have any of that, didn't have any of that. And instead of putting all that in, they leapfrogged in a way and put in the whole cell system and, and all of that. So I'm wondering if the same thing could occur here with all the talk about autonomous vehicles and the problems we're having in urban areas here, whether there could be some kind of leapfrog effect. Instead of building normal roads that we would have here, maybe there's some other type of vehicle, um, drone type thing or autonomous vehicles that might work over there quicker than even here and help the solution. So, and I think Norm, you touched a little on that as well too, but um, I don't know, just comment on that maybe. <laughs> well, it's interesting to, you know, I guess what I'm spending a lot of time focusing on, I mean, I, I, mean, I think you can walk through um, visions where you could see autonomous vehicles sort of saving rural America or providing extraordinary services to, to small towns, rural, rural towns. You know, one of the things I guess that I'm really focused on, almost more than that, I keep getting back to this sort of ownership and how do you think about infrastructure? Is it, is it a private good or is it a public good? And if it's a public good, how do you um, maximize the benefits of uh, infrastructure for, for people around the world? 
Um, and, and, you know, I don't know, I was just listening to you guys' answers. I'm, I'm actually seriously avoiding answering your question. <laughs> I'll answer but, it in a minute. But, but, but what's really <laughs> interesting is if you listen to your answers, you can imagine a, a book of maps that goes everywhere from local communities who are good at developing their own infrastructure right. versus not so good versus poor to actually community, you know, there's a book by Carl Polanyi called The Great Transformation which hits the money issue that you're talking about, right? Because in, he, he wrote that in 1944, but traditional economies, mm -hmm. and, there's, and there's all sorts of gradations between you know, extreme capitalism like we have here, like I don't move unless you pay me, versus you know, I give you something and three months later, you give me something of equivalent value. Well, that's how business is still done, even in places like Brazil and Sao Paulo, right? I mean. You do favors for people and they do favors for you and, and there's a real, being able to visualize that I think is really interesting because that gets to the cultural uh, and, cultural. And actually I, I would dispute the, that we are an extreme version of I won't do anything until you pay me. We live on debt. Our, our society is fueled by credit. Our society is fueled by trust. Um, I, I, you know, I want to respond to the gentleman who raised the question of machines replacing people, and 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 it goes to this idea uh, that that people have of are we built, are we driving ourselves toward a dystopian future? Are we driving towards a utopia? Will it be a pig's breakfast of both? Um, it, you know, and I think that this is an important point that Norm raises is that we do need to be mindful and purposeful. And I think that everybody in this room has that uh, uh, perspective. But I, I would like to point out that what I think we're seeing with people and technology is that in some situations technology is beating us. Yes, the Go champion uh, of the world was beaten. Uh, yes, the chess master was beaten. There are many other instances where humans consistently beat machines. And then we also have an enormous amount of evidence that people augmented by machines are beating all both of those prior situations. So Gary Kasparov found that he was beaten by a machine. But when these chess masters pair with a machine, they're beating everybody else, including just the machines. And so I think that this is one of the most fascinating points about the future, is this augmented future. And I'd also, uh, you know, I, I don't know if there are more questions, but I, I do want to end also, oh, one more? All right, so we'll take you, and then I want to end on a happy note, because we need to go drink and make <laughs> cheers, you know, <laughs> cheery comments. So go ahead, please. Uh, thank you, Amy Glassmeyer. I just want to um, comment that the federal government over the last hundred years have cre has created agencies and sub-agency programs to rectify the spatially uneven distribution of investment and infrastructure. The Economic Development Administration was both a jobs program, but it was an infrastructure program for places that had essentially been either unable to generate its own revenue, but more importantly, it actually didn't have the political impact. Uh, effect to, to carry out a future that would have brought resources their way. The Appalachian Regional Commission, which is 411 counties, was created to provide infrastructure in a region that was completely inaccessible. Going forward, we need to realize that left to its own devices, infrastructure will go to the places where it has the highest potential to generate a rate of return that is uh, important for the investors. And many places which are off the beaten uh, path are gonna be left behind. And we can see that in the, implication, in the implementation of the Smart Cities program, for example. So when you, you know, get, get away from the hype about what the, the, that kind of program is designed to do, it's basically privileging some places and it's disregarding others. We have an opportunity going forward to to learn from the experiences of uneven development. But if we don't actually do it purposefully, we're going to walk right back into it. I'd like to, th I'd like to think that, I'd like to think that, as the gentleman raised earlier, that, that, that the leapfrogging that takes place for the major urban centers or the denser places will have an effect on the, on the smaller places as well. When you, when you look at the autonomous vehicle and actually calculate at some future date the cost per passenger mile, uh, you, you, know, you may not have to save your money up to, uh, to get a threshold automobile. 
uh, anymore. If you can now afford the first mile immediately and you don't have that threshold cost of a garage, insurance, and a car, uh, I think it makes transportation more accessible to everyone. So I think, I think that there will be leapfrogging opportunities. And so t I don't think technology is anything to, 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 to fear. I think it's absolutely going to help everyone top to bottom, in, in my opinion. Do either of you wish to respond? I, dis I disagree, unless we figure out how to, how to think about it. Yeah. Right. I, you know, and I, it's interesting because I, I, I think it's an interesting question that you've raised, um, you know, again, going back to this purposeful design. Um, but what I do think is interesting about where we are in this stage of technological development um, as Parag has taken us through the connectivity of the world, generally speaking, my feeling is that the momentum is on the side of further connectivity. Um, now, it's a question of timing. Um, you know, how rapidly will that connectivity occur if we're not purposeful about it? Um, I'm seeing the stop sign, so I'll just leave it with one last comment, which is um, I really want to leave you guys with a tantalizing possibility that we really are facing uh, a century of explosive growth uh, uh, of creativity. And it's really this combination of humans and machines. But I think as Mona and Jeff are showing, it's also the how do we bring a uh, group of people, which numbers in the billions, that are currently unconnected into our developed world. And, and what does that portend? And so I go back to, like I said, I've been looking at pre-money societies. I've been looking at ancient civilizations. And if you, if you take a look at what happened, so several millennia ago, the Egyptians and other very sophisticated sophisticated civilizations develop literacy, numeracy. I'm not sure which one came first, probably numeracy. Um, but they developed this. And then you had the ancient Greeks that were sort of running around in their bear skins and caves. And then all of a sudden, uh, we, we think that they discovered literacy and numeracy somewhere. The, the first ar architectural, or excuse me, archaeological artifact is about 750 BC. So let's say around 800-ish. BC, they discovered writing and numeracy, and then all of a sudden, a couple hundred years later, they revolutionized the world across philosophy, science, uh, really this, the whole discipline of observation, exploration, and an analysis. And so when I think about Mona's local dispersed populations and bringing those people in uh, from, into, if, if we look at ourselves as the ancient Egyptians and the Mesopotamians as this intensely sophisticated society using dazzling technology, and then all of a sudden, a little later, the Greeks come along and blow it out of the water. I don't know. I just think we have a very exciting future ahead of us. Thank you.